Let's talk about it. Let's talk about my testimony. Let's talk about those thoughts that keep my mind in this negative terminal. I've lost 45 friends to gun violence. Let's talk about those nights. Let's talk about that pain. Are you listening? You can't hear me. You can't hear my pain. You can't make me make myself feel better. And I learned at a young age it was never about the cheddar. So many friends in prison because of it, and I can't even swallow my pride and write them a letter. Let's talk about why my people want to be so flashy and gain so much self-indulgence. See, I'm not blaming you all, but you told me I was a criminal before I knew what jail was. You told me I was less than before I could add or subtract. Let's talk about those days at my friend's house hearing, why is this nigger in my house? Let's talk about my first best friend having to stop hanging out with me in fifth grade because hanging out with black kids will lead him to trouble. Let's talk about how I have to take my hands out of my pockets before I go to any store just so I won't be convicted of suspicion. Let's talk about how I have to walk across the street if I see a woman on the same side of the street as me in fear that she is in fear. Let's talk about the accidental mason that happened to me when I sneeze walking past a woman, and maybe she was trying to bless me, but the only substitute she had for holy water was mace. Let's talk about this illusion, this confusion. You don't know me, but you can define me. My people are lost, and I am still trying to find me. I want to talk to you about why you have these irrational fears but you don't want to talk about it. In high school, I was given the opportunity to share my story. In the basement of Washburn High School, in a little room painted in all black would be where I found out about Black Box Theater. A woman by the name of Crystal Spring took away our phones and told us to write poems. She told us to create stories. She gave us the opportunity to get up in front of hundreds of people touring to different schools in Minnesota. But the most critical thing that I could take from her class was this banner stretching the wall. A voice for the voiceless, it said. That has now become my purpose. My purpose is to be a voice for those affected by racial discrimination. By talking about the experiences I have gone through, to challenge the audience's thoughts on the reality of ethnicity and the effects of racial discrimination. Knowing that it is possible to fix the wounds of evilness. Even with my experiences, I still believe that it is possible to end individual and systematic discrimination. But if we are not willing to change our minds, we are not being critical thinkers. I want you to know that I'm your brother. I'm your son. I am that kid that lives next door. And you don't have to prove to me that you aren't racist. I am someone who is going to love you regardless of if you love me or not. With that being said, you have a great responsibility. There are some things we need to see stopped transformed and reformed. Racial discrimination is not about what white people are doing wrong. Black people discriminate against other black people, and other ethnicities have prejudices and discriminate against black people as well. We must all help break the barriers of individual and systemic racial discrimination that has long been upheld because of white supremacy. With that being said, white guilt doesn't save lives. Stop having this false pity for me. Stop teaching your children to not see color. I understand it protects you from not seeming racist, but not seeing color only invalidates my experiences as a black man. If you don't see color, look at the obvious disparities in my community, the educational disparities, the economic opportunities, our neighborhoods and our work conditions. And the most frustrating part about it all is when people fail to look at my experiences and ask questions like, hasn't racism changed? Racism has changed. As my mother would say, racism is now sugar-coated. Because now I can work with you, but you don't have to approve of my life. 
Now I can go to school with you, play football with you, but you can never take me home to your family. When I mention my favorite foods, you remind me of how you've never heard of it. When I tell you that I am from North Minneapolis, you ask me how it is to live in the ghetto. I can see the spiral of non-intentional, unconscious, racially taught, media-reinforced racial ideologies you have towards me. And I don't believe that all the prejudices you have towards me are completely your fault. Black people are constantly perceived on television as criminals, dangerous, thugs, entertainers, or athletes. We are perceived to be lower achievers, rebellious, disrespectful, violent, and loud. But most of all, a fear to our nation. These ideologies were used in the slavery and Jim Crow times as propaganda to help America see black people as inferior. And it worked. And it is still working. Even now, as a black man is shot dead and killed in New York City, by a white man, all they seem to mention is how nicely dressed the white man is, but bring up the black man's criminal record. I want you to know that even though you have these prejudices towards me, and you might use the movies or the media for your reason to justify why, I want you to know I genuinely have love for you. Because although racism didn't start with us, it can end with us. We are reminded that black men should be more obedient and maybe they wouldn't die from police brutality. What picture are they painting you? What picture are they painting you? We are in historical times and a lot of historical things are repeating you. But as my neighbor, I must tell you that my neighborhood's history is far unlike yours. I've lived in North Minneapolis most of my entire life. I've seen boys play basketball from sunup to sundown. I've seen girls sit outside and get their hair did. I've seen boys and girls bike around from street light to street light. But you know what? It was the drug dealers who bought all the kids on the block ice cream. It was the gangbangers who made sure you got home safe. It was the unfit mothers who let children stay at their houses when they didn't have houses of their own. And it was the graffiti-filled parks that made us into our own superheroes. I concluded that my life was regular. The things going on in my community happened in every community. I would soon realize how falsified this information was. Drug raids were my normal. Only two kids being allowed to go into a corner store at one time was my normal. Being one of the few kids on the block who knew his father was my normal. There was a five-year-old boy shot and killed a block away from my house while he was sleeping. Now that wasn't normal, but it happened. And even as I moved over to the south side of Minneapolis, I would soon realize that there was a lot of similarities that the neighborhoods that I lived in had. So I have a question for you. If this was my normal, why wasn't this your normal? Was this the normal that Martin Luther King dreamed for his nation? So I'm asking you today, can you use my experiences? I have an African proverb and I'll leave you with this. If you stand on a man's back, you can see further and reach higher. Can you all stand on my back, using my experiences to speak up and be a voice for the voiceless? God bless.